Diane Ravitch is the president and co-founder of the Network for Public Education. She is an historian of education and research professor of education at New York University. Diane blogs at dianeravitch.net and her blog has surpassed 36 million hits. She has written 11 books, including her latest book, Slaying Goliath. Professor Kevin Wellner teaches education policy and law, and he's the director of the National Education Policy Center, commonly known as NEPC, which is housed at the University of Colorado. NEPC works to build bridges between the research world and the broader public. Kevin has authored or edited more than a dozen books and more than 100 articles and book chapters, including my favorite, Closing the Opportunity Gap, as well as the new book that we're going to speak to you about this evening, which is called Potential Grizzlies, Making the Nonsense Bearable. Now, Kevin and I have been friends for nearly two decades, and I will always be grateful to him because he is the person who introduced me via email to Diane Ravitch. And with that, I'd like to welcome Diane and Kevin and let the conversation begin. Thank, thank you so much, Carol. And thank you, Kevin, for being here this evening. I look forward to the evening. I uh, tweeted, tweeted about it a few times and I referred to you as the Abbott and Costello, um, the Woody Allen, the Stephen Colbert, and a couple of other uh, comedians that, that I threw in there uh, of, of American education. Uh, we happen to be in a field that's been under siege for about 20 years, and there's not a lot to laugh about. And the last four years has been totally grim uh, in terms of uh, federal education policy, state education policy, and it was refreshing to pick up your book uh, or to read it online, as it were, and uh, to see that you were able to, uh, to make me laugh very hard again and again. So I hope that everybody will order a copy of Potential Grizzlies and uh, remember that the reason that this book is called Potential Grizzlies is that when Betsy DeVos was uh, interviewed by the Senate uh, committee that was asked to confirm her, uh, she was asked to, speak on the subject of guns in schools. And she said, well, you know, there is a school in, I think it was Wyoming. And she said, there, there might be potential grizzlies and, <laughs> and they might, they would need to be prepared for the potential grizzlies. So um, Kevin has with his unbelievable wit taken that term and turned it into uh, a book, not just about Betsy DeVos, but about all the nonsense that has uh, inundated this field for many years. And I'd say that if there is an, an underlying theme other than making fun of, of foolishness, uh, it's the disconnect between research and policy. And Kevin frequently refers to this, uh, that what researchers know and have established for a long, long time, a period of time, uh, is not somehow, doesn't reach the ears of policymakers. They continue doing the same stupid things over and over again. And uh, we haven't quite figured out how to get through to them that what they're doing has been proven wrong. Uh, and uh, maybe the best thing we can do right now is laugh about it and hope that some of the incoming policymakers are wiser, or if they're not wiser, they'll read Kevin's book and fear of being satirized. Um, so Kevin, I, I uh, saw in your introduction that the reason you wrote this that was that you had a newborn baby and you had a semester off and she was strapped to your chest and uh, you didn't want to do any useful work, so you decided to write these onion-like pieces for your friends, and this was the genesis of Potential Grizzlies. Uh, you want to say anything more about that? Well, she's now 12 years old <laughs> in the other room, um, and uh, yeah, so that was, that was where I got started, and I, and I was publishing these really just for friends, and um, they, they encouraged me to continue, and eventually I started writing um, April Fool's pieces for the Policy Center um, that also got joined in there. And then as I started putting them together, I wrote a few more, including some that are you know, just from this you know, COVID era um, for the book. By the way, thank you, Diane, and thank you, Carol, for the nice introduction. Well, the, the only thing that I was missing in Potential Grizzlies and which I'm missing in general is that every year the NEPC used to give out Buncombe Awards. That's right. And the Buncombe Award was for the, the absolute worst research 
that was totally dishonorable. Uh, and you stopped doing that. And I always look forward to that because you would have your number one grand bunkum prize and then a number two and number three. And these would usually be uh, pieces that came out of very partisan organizations, uh, not even, they, they call themselves think tanks, but they were so biased that uh, yeah. the research was laughable and you did a good job of debunking uh, them by giving them the Buncombe Awards. What happened to the Buncombes? Yeah, we also got uh, David Berliner to dress up in a tuxedo, I believe, to, <laughs> to uh, it, hand those out. Yeah, it, it, um, I think for, for, for me, it ran its course in the sense that, that the nonsense became just too repetitive. It was the same people who we felt like we needed to honor year after year for doing the same things. Um, it's, it's part of the pain of what we, what we go through as people who care about education and research that we, we, we try to, um, to laugh at it for a while and then it starts to become painful. So uh, I, I, was trying to, I, I, I was trying to think of which were the funniest pieces in the book and it's really hard to say, uh, but I'm gonna touch on a couple of them. Uh, I started out and you started out with uh, Duncan Fine's shortcut in preparing for Senate hearings, uh, which is that the, um, they realized that, that the preparation for Duncan was the same as the preparation for Margaret Spellings because he was giving the same answers. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, part of what, what, I, what was going through uh, my mind when I started doing all of this 12 years ago was how much the policies that Duncan brought into the Obama administration mirrored the policies that um, the George W. Bush administration um, had been administering. I and mean, the, the clear dis difference was on private school vouchers, but virtually everything else seemed the same. Well, uh, and what follows directly onto that is the, when Secretary Duncan's outbursts more a research conference and every time someone says something that's been proven by research, he jumps up and says, you lie, you lie. <laughs> yeah, that was a play on, I don't know, this, this goes back a ways, but if you recall when, um, I think it was dealing with the healthcare debate, but it was a, a congressman named Joe Wilson who jumped up during during the State of the Union and screamed, you lie at Obama. So that, that's what- And Duncan said, you lie at an AERA meeting. <laughs> yes, so Duncan just that was, that was jumping great. up and screaming, you lie. And then of course, um, and, I... and part of that also, if I recall, part of that piece that I was um, trying to, to get across was how much it seemed that uh, the, the Duncan, Arnie Duncan and people around him seemed like an echo chamber for themselves and really didn't let in the information from the research field that would undermine a lot of what they were doing. Yeah, I had the same impression. I met with him early on in his tenure and he took careful notes and then I guess he just tore them up and threw them away. I don't know why he, why he bothered to take notes uh, because nothing I said got through into his brain. Um, and then of course, there's that very important piece about um, big news connection discovered between research and policy. <laughs> but we know that hasn't happened yet. So that was purely imaginary. <laughs> Yeah, so one of the things that I that I did in the book, by the way, the book is, I have not received a hard copy yet either, Diane. Uh, so Diane had to get an electronic copy because we, because we're doing this so early uh, after the book came out. I haven't received my copy yet. Um, my copies, I think I get three. <laughs> but um, one of the things that, that uh, I did with the book was to um, illustrate the different stories with images. Um, and I think for the one about um, the connection between uh, research and policy being discovered, it, the, the illustration was an electron microscope that was able to tease this out. <laughs> it was such a small connection. And then you have the gold standard research found to consist of goals, a fool's gold. And this was the, uh, yeah. what is it? Randomized control trials, the RCTs. And you point out, and I think it, it's actually, uh, although it's funny, it's actually a very serious piece about the flaws and, and the randomized controlled trials uh, that everyone takes to be the gold standard and which you point out very uh, sensibly, uh, lots of variables are simply not taken into account in the RCTs. Yeah, and it's, you know, what, what's going on, and, and I hopefully this will change with the new, under the new administration, but for years we've had the IES, you know, the main federal agency handing out federal research grants, 
uh, elevating the uh, randomized controlled trial approach so far above other research approaches. Um, and randomized controlled trials can be effective and can be useful in making causal claims, but they are also, they have their own very significant limitations. And there are other approaches that, that provide richer answers to a lot of research questions. Um, so, you know, what we're seeing right now, for example, around the vaccine trials, those are genuine um, blind uh, randomized control trials, but the one that the, the, the approach used in, in uh, education cannot be the same. We don't, um, people who are subjected to a treatment know they're being subjected to a treatment, for example. There's lots, there's lots of uncooperative um, control uh, people in control groups in terms of, you know, if I didn't get in, I didn't get my voucher. So I went to a, a different private school instead of just staying where I was supposed to be in the study. And there's so many other limitations around the, uh, the randomized control approach using, for example, lotteries in education that are just not acknowledged when we use this term, the gold standard. I guess what frustrated me most about those uh, randomized control trials was that I, I would read them very carefully and I would ask myself, well, how many kids dropped out? Yep. And the figure often wasn't even mentioned. And when it was mentioned, it was huge. And you think, well, what does this research mean if half the kids who started didn't even complete? And they, they didn't treat that as a serious issue. I, at least none of the RCTs that I've read about vouchers uh, made a big deal out of the fact that 42% uh, of the kids who entered and got a voucher uh, left before the before they graduated, or in some cases even even larger numbers. Yeah, and I can't I can't blame the the research design or the researchers for that. You know, you do you do your best, right? Given given the real world circumstances, I what I what I'm frustrated by is the the overwrought claims that we make about them and the dismissal of other approaches that are stronger in other ways. Well, another one that I loved, and I could go, just go through these and, and name them all, but I won't. Uh, prestigious task force calls on reformers to redouble their failures. <laughs> the re I guess the reason I love this is because a, a week or so, to, a week or two weeks ago, I spoke to Texas public education advocates and recited all of the failures of the charter movement in Texas. And they keep in pouring more, millions and millions more, despite the fact that the charters get lower test scores, lower graduation rates, lower college, uh, lower scores when they enter college. Uh, they have absolutely no impact on, on uh, learnings after, after high school or college. And I said, if you have negative results in every single aspect, why is another 200 million going into expanding what's already failed? So you, got, you hit that one for me. Yeah, you know, I, I'm remembering it probably is now a decade ago, but I wrote a piece for Ed Week um, saying at what, asking at what point does does reform become status quo, right? We I think we're, we're there. <laughs> I think we were there a decade ago. We are there. We, yeah. we have to change the status quo and the status quo is this uh, mad push for, high, well, it's not even a promotion anymore. We have high stakes testing everywhere. You can't even do a research project on high stakes testing because everyone is subject to it. Yeah. Um, so then there is a child's choice. A child's <laughs> school is a child's choice. The children choose the school, not the family. Yeah, I like and that. And of course, the children uh, don't want to have a, a certain teacher or a school because it's too hard. They want to have the one where they play all the time. Uh, it, it takes the this idea of choice and takes it to its logical extreme. Exactly. There, there is so much fetishization of this idea of choice and this idea that parents always make the best decisions for their kids. And I wish that were true. Um, you know, I, I, I'm trying to remember whether there's something in this book on this or not, but you know, what about parents who are neo-Nazis, you know, whose choice for their kid is, you know, a nice neo-Nazi upbringing? Is that something that we, that we want to hold up as the ideal? Um, and, you know, there are some really serious questions about the role of the parent, you know, that the child is sort of a, creature of just the parents or also a creature of society and a creature that has his or her or their own um, discretion about choosing the life that they want. Um, well, so also yes, is, this is, I think this will come up with um, vac vaccines. The yeah. Of, uh, you know, yeah. 
how much is individual choice override the good of the community? Uh, yeah. We'll see that, in, I think, in the near future. One of my favorites here is, and it's again in the headline, new study links teacher unions to Satan. <laughs> And any union folks in the audience? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that, that, that one's pretty self-explanatory. It's this, that was written during this period of time that I think is now letting up a little bit, but, you know, sort of the Michelle Rhee era. Um, that was, it reminds me of another, another one that I think you skipped over about, um, is it uh, Governor, what's well, the Governor oh, of Wisconsin? Governor Scott Walker oh. and his love affair with Michelle Rhee. Yeah, that he was all doing it. It was a Jodie Foster. He had a crush on Michelle. Yeah, he was. He really just did it to impress Jodie Foster, which in this case, but impress Michelle Reed. Uh, and then one of my favorites. I keep saying one of my favorites. This is another favorite. Chartering authority given to fast food chains, <laughs> and we have McDonald's uh, offering charters and and Kentucky Fried Chicken and Wendy's, and uh, it it's uh, unfortunately it's too close to truth. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it is it is true that the, I, there are people who feel like the more we open it up, um, you know, with, with no regulation to who runs who who runs a school, the better better off we are. And you know, fast food chains have these benefits that they you know they come with uniforms, right? And there's there's clearly a, a shortcut to the cafeteria, prop, you know, the, the providing providing food for kids and. Um, lots of other really nice options that come with um, the expertise that a fast food chain uh, brings to the brings to the table, so to speak. I, I often think of the um, kind of well. I, I think back to G what I've read of Jeannie Allen's in the Center for Education Reform, and I know you have an essay here where you refer to Alan Jean. Uh, you have a number of the reformers referred to by very similar names. Chester Finn appears as Chester Gill. Um, <laughs> But I, I know that Jeannie has said in, in her various writings about charters that the best charter law is one of the least regulation. Yep. So Arizona, therefore, is the absolute best state because they don't regulate at all. And um, it's, it's kind of astonishing when you think public money with no accountability and no regulation will lead to great schools, except we don't have any evidence that that's true. Yeah, you know, our policy center for years has been doing these think tank reviews and um, I don't know if we've done one of these recently, but Jeannie Allen's group is one of the group, one of the organizations that puts out these rankings, you know, state state level rankings, which is the best state for charter school laws, that sort of thing. And they do um, rank the states based on you know the, the best being the least regulated, uh, which which begs the question, right? You know, so the rankings come out and the rankings are published by these, you know. Um, credulous, I'll say, uh, outlets, media outlets that say, you know, Colorado ranks number three without really providing the readers with much idea about what that actually means. And in the case of, of Center for Education Reform, it just means that they're unregulated. Right. And it's, it's really astonishing where you could take the same set of rankings and say, these are states that let anybody have public money to do whatever they want and to attract children with uh, advertising and marketing. Uh, and then have no accountability for how the money is spent or whether anyone gets an education. Uh, then there's the gang fight that sends reading specialists to the hospital. This is about the reading wars and how the uh, phonics first people fight the whole language people. And it's, uh, uh, I guess, based on West Side Story. At least your illustration is. <laughs> very, very yeah. clever. Yeah, I've never, I mean, I'm not a reading specialist. It's not my field of expertise, but I've never understood the um, vehemence um, within which, you know, one, one side will argue that this is the only tool that should be in the toolbox. Um, and what's going on right now, as you probably know, is that the, um, the phonemic awareness people are, um, have, have basically taken over policy. Um, and, and squeezed out a lot of um, the sort of the whole language approaches. I mean, that these are sloppy terms in a lot of ways, right? So the idea of balanced right. literacy is being pushed, pushed aside because it's too whole languagey. Um, well, and I think, you know, I think it harms yeah. kids. You know, like you, I'm not a reading specialist, but I've written about the reading wars and, and read all the literature. And I always come away thinking, shouldn't it be both? 
Yep. I mean, wouldn't you want to have a teacher who could do both things and decide what's best for the child in front of them? Yeah. Uh, it just seems to make sense to me uh, as opposed to saying I'm on one side or the other side. Uh, and uh, I'm about to post something. I've been pushing it back because of all the news, but I wrote something about why I object to the use of the term, the science of reading, because it yep. seems to me there's no such thing as the science of teaching history or the science of teaching mathematics. Uh, and there's no science, that, there's no science in reading. It's, it's in most cases, just a matter of knowing all the, the various tools for your toolbox and knowing the children in front of you. Um, but another one of my, uh, one that I enjoyed was Bloomberg acquires partial stake in LAUSD. Uh, I think he just acquired a partial stake or tried to buy a partial stake in Oakland and got defeated. Yeah, although I think probably he probably has a partial stake in Indianapolis right now. <laughs> Do you want me to, I could actually, um, I was just, just brought up the, the uh, that's on page 23 of the book. Do you want me to read a little bit of that one? Sure. So, yeah, so the title is uh, Bloomberg Acquires Partial Stake in LAUSD. And I was thinking about that one because the election just occurred and, and LAUSD's board did flip to, um, to the Bloomberg endorsed candidates. Um, I believe he put, put in money again. I know he put a lot of money into Oakland, as you mentioned. Um, so it starts back in the winter of 2017 when former New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg made a quick trip to Los Angeles to purchase a couple Bel Air mansions and ideological control over the city's school district, he may not have realized the long journey ahead. After months of behind the scenes machinations that many market observers thought would lead to the full sale of the Los Angeles Unified School District to an investment group led by Bloomberg, the city's voters decided to hand over a mere partial stake. This setback notwithstanding, Bloomberg spokesman, Ali Garkey, insists that further acquisitions in this and other districts will take place over the next several years. Quote, we have a long-term investment strategy, Garkey explained. We expect to liquidate unproductive assets in the LAUSD, and we expect new investors to join our team. He added that Bloomberg and his allies are working hard to ensure devaluation of unacquired schools in districts throughout the US marketplace. The problem, of course, this is another quote, the quote, the problem, of course, is that the bidding procedure in school district elections is too unpredictable, said Garkey. How fair is it when the high bidder is denied the purchase? Most investors are unwilling to enter a market with such high risk, as is the system is unworkable and unacceptable. The entire investment community must now work together to design a more reliable election process and, more welcome, and a more welcome marketplace for venture capitalists. That's, that's about a third of the piece. It goes on to some other. <laughs> Well, I should mention that all of these are short pieces, which makes them very readable and, and uh, very succinct. Um, it's astonishing because what's going on right now, and, and you know, you hit on a very important issue, as all of these do, that underneath the humor is something that, that is not funny at all. And when you think about a district like Indianapolis, where people who live in the community want to run for the school board, they work very hard in their local school, they have $12,000 to spend. They raise another two or three. They're killed, killed because Stanford children, Bloomberg, our, our Reed Hastings, or the Walton family, uh, pour in a few million dollars mm -hmm. and they don't have a chance because they're outspent five to one, 10 to one. And but, there's but, something that is fundamentally not just undemocratic, but anti-democratic about having these people for whom the money is nothing because Bloomberg's worth $50 billion. By now he may be worth $60 billion. For him to throw a million dollars into a school district here or there, it would be like me going out and buying uh, a piece of candy. It, it means nothing. And if he loses, uh, it doesn't, you, you just wonder why they're not spending 50 million instead of only 2 million because or three or four or 10. Um, but it's, it's a, to me, it's a very serious problem in our democracy. And no one even talks about it except, you know, nerds like us who still care that people should be able to elect their local school board and not have billionaires from either in-state or out-of-state uh, take control and buy a partial in, uh, piece of it or the whole district, which they will do if they feel like it. Yeah, the, I think the giant now that that is, um, I don't know if Bloomberg's involved, but there's this organization called City Fund. I believe, I, I think I have that term right. I think Reed um, Hastings and John Arnold are the big funders yeah. there and probably the Waltons and possibly Bloomberg too. I mean, they, they all have so much money that this is like a game for them. Yeah. 
and they've invested uh, in, they were invested in, I think, Nashville, and they had a, a list of cities where they were putting in. They, the day they opened, they had $200 million. You know, it's a juggernaut. It's an anti-democratic juggernaut. And I wish that there were some way to make them feel ashamed of what they're doing. So I, I, I just say I'm putting them on my wall of shame. It doesn't seem to affect them at all. <laughs> anyway, so now we have those dreadful teachers and you've discovered that bumps on the head, as in phrenology, is the key to a new teacher quality model. Yeah, I, I, I wrote a few pieces about this, you know, those dreadful teachers idea that, that there was so much going on during the Obama administration in particular that was focused on trying to rank teachers, identify teachers, um, sort of publicly shame teachers, um, based largely on student test scores. Um, and I have another piece um, that focuses on economists in particular, I think one or two pieces on economists. But it, you know, a lot of this was driven by these econometric models that used test scores and found that they could differentiate between different teachers based on student test scores. Um, and if you recall, Los the Los Angeles Times at one point Published teachers' names attached to their growth, their growth, the students' growth scores, basically their their scores based on student growth, um, and it was just a, it was a it was a wacky time period where there seemed to be this this incredible buy-in to this this crazy idea that that somehow we could determine teachers' value based on these scores. Um, yeah, one of them, was, I just have it in front of me, bottom 5% of economists face dismissal. Do you remember that one? Right, yes, on page 31. Bottom 5% of economists face dismissal. Then you also have teacher effectiveness linked to height. So yeah. To teachers, right? Yeah, I'm trying to find, because I, I think it might be and fun to read the, that And one. New, the new bottom 5% of teachers mysteriously appear after the old ones are fired. <laughs> that was uh, Eric Hanyashek of, of Hoover and Stanford, who had the theory that if you fired the bottom 5%, he may have said the bottom 10% every year, uh, you could improve because if you get rid of the worst teachers, the new ones will just be average. And yep. as you point out, you'll always have a bottom 5%. You'll always have a bottom 5%. And, and the, other, the other real important truth is that is that you can't, even, even if there is a, um, an, an important element of uh, value attached to these student test scores that are being measured. There are so many unintended consequences dealing with teacher churn in that case, but also dealing with the narrowing, you know, the, the higher the stakes that we attach to a student's test score, the more it's going to narrow what schools teach kids and how they teach kids. And, and that was never really understood by, by the economists and others who were pushing, pushing this idea. And another of yours, and I, I think a couple of these, the one about ARSE gives teacher quality rankings first place. I think that was the takeoff on NCTQ, uh, the National Council on Teacher Quality, which you called NQTC or something like that. Yes, I, I have a few, I have a few that, I, that's, that's an infuriating organization for me. Um, well, it is, and I, I was there when it was created by the Thomas B. Fordham Institute. That's right, you used to be on the board of that. And uh, at the time it was just a couple of people and it was floundering and they didn't know how they were going to survive. Oh. And then out of the blue, uh, back in two, 2000 or so, 2001, two, three, uh, Rod Page gave them $5 million and they found their purpose. Yeah. Uh, and had the money to, um, to you know, sit, sit and look at catalogs of teachers colleges and, and rank them based on their catalog which they're yeah. still doing, but now they have a very prestigious board, you know, prestigious in that it's filled with people like Wendy Kopp and, and reformers. I think Joel Klein was on their board at one time. They also get Gates money, so they no longer have to rely on the government. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's an infuriating organization because they had no expertise in teacher evaluation or yeah. ranking. And again, it's, an, it's infuriating in part because people pay attention. Right, so they get these these like more credulous uh, news news coverage about their rankings and about the, you know, they're, they're here in Colorado. A lot of their their ideas have been adopted in terms of the the state um, 
not quite as bad as it used to be, but in terms of, of the state's consideration of how well a school of education is doing, and it's it, these are these are these are people and ideas that should not be taken so so seriously, and yet they are. Well, I think what gave them a added credibility was that they uh, were asked by a U.S. News and World Report to become the arbiters of which ed schools were good and which were bad, and they never visited ed schools. They all they did was look at their catalogs. And I remember Linda Darling Hammond saying this would be like judging the quality of a restaurant based on its menu and never actually eating the food. Uh, then we have um, the out of field doctoring addressed by Operate for America. And Operate for America sends in young people to be surgeons and doctors uh, with no training at all to replace uh, people who are out of field teachers. I think we just lost your sound. Do we do we have sound? Okay. So okay. what happened on this end? It's sort of funny. Uh, my dog was barking, so I muted myself so I, so she wouldn't be you wouldn't hear her in the background. Um, I'd rather hear the, the dog barking than have you muted. <laughs> the problem is the system lets me mute but not unmute. Um, so <laughs> that was the problem. So I'm sorry. So I, I was reminded when I read this article about uh, the, the takeoff on Teach for America that many years ago, uh, somebody did a piece and it was a serious piece in the Wall Street Journal saying, we should have an organization modeled on Teach for America and call it Heal for America. And they would be assistants to doctors. And of course they wouldn't have the ability to actually do any medical work. They could just go in and tell people, are you using the medicines correctly? And they could give them advice about uh, nutrition and things like that. Yeah, well, that's but, fine. <laughs> yeah, you know, they it was they understood you can't let these untrained people do anything serious. Yeah. We, on the other hand, have Teach for America, where they do they're seriously in front of a classroom uh, with minimal training. Yeah, that's because because teachers, uh, doctors are professionals, but teachers aren't. And that's right. That's, that's the thinking. Yeah. Right. So then you get to the parent trigger, another of my favorites. And uh, you have the parent trigger being used to convert failing charters into unionized public schools. I wish that existed. <laughs> Unfortunately, it doesn't. I've been wondering yeah, uh, who's going to save the kids from the failing charter schools. Yeah, and one of the one of the the points of that piece. And by the way, I'm not sure if anyone remembers the parent trigger. I wrote when I wrote this, it was all the rage, um, but it really fizzled. Uh, I don't know if well, it ever made its way. They right. actually. I think they converted one or two schools, had no success with it. And yep. then uh, it, it just, the law is still on the book and nothing happened with it other than that a movie was made about it. And the movie uh, disappeared from the theaters after 30 days. So it was- Golden one touch that, that idea I had. Yeah, I mean, the, one of the main ideas that I tried to get across in that parent trigger uh, uh, that, that allowed charter schools to be triggered into uh, unionized uh, neighborhood schools was that all the all the the funders who were so enthusiastic about the first ideas idea for some reason just weren't coming out for that second idea? Um, and yet, uh, Ben Austin managed to raise many millions of dollars for Parent Revolution, uh, yeah. which was his creation, and that he created the Parent Trigger. Yeah. Um, but I liked your article on the Budget Committee settles on tax hikes for third graders. Uh, <laughs> third graders don't have any money, but there's so many of them. Yeah. So how much were they going to be taxed? Fifty thousand dollars each. I think I actually did a calculation to figure out what what would be needed at the time given the national debt. <laughs> but they, they would they would be uh, they would all be in debt. But the, but the thinking is that the, the amount of debt would would be dwarfed later on by their student loans. So it didn't matter. <laughs> well, I thought that was that was a good one. And President Trump boasts that class sizes will be the greatest ever, the biggest ever. <laughs> Only in America. At least we won't have to hear that anymore. Yeah, you know, I, I'm so going to miss his voice. <laughs> I won't. Um, so talk to me about a growth mindset and what you discovered about that. Ah, so that was a fun one to write. Um, so my, my daughter's school uh, kept having these assemblies um, that were these very shallow in my mind, uh, implementations of the growth mindset idea. 
Um, and the, um, the idea just, it struck me as a, um, a perfect idea for a bunch of sort of puns. Um, so, so the growth mindset is, is this, it's a fairly serious idea that, that's been uh, studied by a professor of psychology at Stanford, Carol Dweck. Um, and the basic idea is that it's, it's, a lot of it is common sense. Everyone's going to just sort of start nodding as I explain it. But the basic idea is that, that if we have a, what she calls fixed mindset, which is a conviction that we and other people are either innately smart or innately dumb, then we're less likely to push ourselves or, or those people to learn than if we have this idea of a growth mindset about how if we, if we put in the effort to improve and achieve, that then we will um, see better results. And so the, the piece is called, the piece that I wrote is called Nasty Looking Growth Spotted on Mindset. Uh, and it says, uh, Gwen, Gwen Cooper, a 12 year old attending Bear Basin Middle School became alarmed this morning when her friends noticed an unsightly growth on her mindset. <laughs> Until today, my mindset has always been brilliant, complained Cooper. I was born endowed with one of the best mindsets in the state. My parents have always told me that. Allison Cooper, Gwen's mother, confirmed that a flawless mindset always came naturally to her daughter. Some people just have it, or at least that's what I thought until today, but oh my, what's that dreadful growth she's been burdened with? Um, Gwen is not sure of her next steps. Honestly, I don't know what to do, she told us. Maybe through effort, perseverance, and hard work, I can fix my mindset and get rid of the growth. That was, that's, that's good. I, I, um... One of my grandchildren was in sixth grade and he said, uh, Grandma, we're studying growth mindset. And I thought, why? why? I mean, you're supposed to do growth mindset, not, not be in sixth grade and study it. And, and it seemed to me uh, somebody was taking their graduate studies uh, a little too seriously and giving it to uh, sixth graders. Um, so you have the reformers tackling a deficiency in children's screen time. Talk about that. So that, that is definitely one of my pet peeves um, about how much um, policymakers and I think educators have grabbed onto this idea that technology is going to make their, uh, going to make education so much better. Um, and there are a lot of problems with that, but one of them is that we are at, our schools are now asking our kids to spend even more time in front of screens. Um, and so that piece is just playing on this idea that maybe the problem is that our kids just aren't spending enough time in front of screens and we have to do something about it. So do you think that because of the pandemic that the uh, love affair with screen, with being on screens is, has lost its luster? I think that because of the pandemic, um, there is more cynicism about the potential of education to, to replace, or excuse me, the potential of technology and software to replace teachers, right? Because we were seeing, at least I was seeing a, a lot of sort of well-funded think tank reports saying, we just need to um, keep the best teachers, increase class size and use technology to fill, to fill the gaps. Um, and I think that what we're seeing now is a broad understanding that these that direct relationships between teachers who know their, their students and students who know and trust the adults in their school uh, is extremely important. And if we lose that, we lose a big part of the learning experience. Um, so, so that I think is happening. I'm a little bit less sanguine about the idea that technology itself is losing its luster. Um, I mean, we, we love our phones. You know? Right. No, technology is not going to go away, but I, my sense, again, largely from uh, hearing from par parents and teachers and my own grandchildren, is that they long to be in the classroom with teachers. They are so sick of screen time. They're, act they're literally bored with it. And a lot of kids are absentee and or they'll turn the screen on and um, turn off their video and no one knows if they're there or not. But I think that there's just a very huge element of boredom. Uh, and they've had so much screen time that they are desperate to be back in real school. Yeah, so I, I think there is a certain disillusionment with the uh, how technology might replace teachers. I don't think it ever will. There's something fundamental about education that involves human interaction and not interaction with the screen. 
Well, I think there's something fundamental about being a human that means that involves getting away from, you know, the, the cameras and, and screens um, and that we are, you know, setting aside the issue of education and kids. I think that, that we as a whole need to get outside more. So i um, curious, your, your pieces, you have six pieces, five pieces here about ed tech. Were these written before the pandemic? I think somewhere, I, I don't have it in front of me. Um, well, you have introducing the flipped off classroom. <laughs> I assume that this is about um, uh, Khan Academy. Yeah, the flipped, the flipped, <laughs> that was just a pun. It was, it was not, nothing against the idea of a flipped classroom. It was just having fun with this idea. So it was, it was saying that, um, you know, it, there's a, there's, there's a benefit to um, no longer censoring our kids and our uh, teachers and, our, and expecting different vocabulary and different behavior in schools than we have in, in workplaces. So, you know, if you, I'm a former lawyer. If you go to a law firm, it's not like um, blue language is, is absent. Right? There's, people speak, you know, people are constantly cursing. Um, so why not have that, uh, you know, Part of the part of the, the school environment, so that was the idea behind it. But it was really just having fun with the idea of changing a flip a flipped classroom to a flipped off classroom. Your your third essay on screen time is one that uh, uh, I I feel strongly about this. It's reformers automate personalization. Yeah. Because what I what I have done whenever I write about personalization is I call it depersonalization. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, one of my, one of my personalization also... means screen time. Yeah, personalization means screen time. Isn't that isn't that funny? Yeah, one of my favorite comedians of all time is George Carlin, uh, who who would have he would I I wish he had done a bit on personalization of education because he would have you know, he he this idea that you can you can take a word and change its meaning in in such a complete way, um, and people just accept it unquestioningly. Um, so somehow the idea of personalization means designing software that is able to um, respond in some way to where you are in your learning process. That's, that's personalization. But personalization in the real world means people, right? people who actually know one another and develop relationships with one another and care about one another. Yes, um, and personalization in education has come to mean uh, interaction with an algor algorithm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is totally depersonalized. Um, it, talk about books. <laughs> MOOCs being the takeoff on MOOCs yeah. was was like ten years ago. It was like the thing. It was going to change higher education was, so. completely. Half of the universities and colleges, if not more, would go out of business in the face of MOOCs. Yep. Yeah. So MOOCs was what is it? Massive online open courses. Open courses. Yeah. It, it was. It was supposed to take, and they still exist. But the but the hype is is definitely less now than it used to be. But yeah, MOOCs were gonna take over, particularly higher education, they're just gonna take over. So, um, oh gosh, I forgot that. So I, I, I wrote about this thing called BOOCS, B-O-O-C-S, BOOCS, uh, a game changer. Um, and BOOCS stands for, I'm looking here in my story, trying to remember, big, outrageously original concept. Um, and I have a picture here of uh, President Trump in front of St. John's uh, Church in Washington, D.C., holding up his book, um, and a very well-known picture. He had, he had to um, go through a lot of effort just to get to that church that day. So the, the idea is, is just a, a pun on this idea that, that uh, you know, from changing from MOOC to book, and this idea that we can trumpet a, um, learning platform as uh, having all these wonderful features uh, that I explained books have. And uh, tell us about the student group that advocates for great inflation. <laughs> so um, Diane, I'm trying to think, how long has it been since you, since you taught in higher education? Um, actually, I just retired from NYU September 1st, but I haven't taught in about 10 years. Yeah, so, so I mean, I. I those of us, and I, I could actually look at the screen here and see some of my students here, so I'm gonna have to be careful, but, um, <laughs> but there is this phenomenon that, um, that occurs in higher education and certainly in K-12 where um, 
students expect high grades for doing pretty much nothing um, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and complain when the grade uh, isn't as, as high as they feel like it should be. Um, so the, the, story, the story was sort of me blowing off steam about that, uh, that occurring. So it's basically about a student group uh, that meets in a bar and complains about grade inflation because they, they really, you know, they bought the book and even came to class sometimes and, and, and somehow they didn't do well in the class even though they went through all that effort. And um, Secretary DeVos's secret meeting with the potential grizzly. <laughs> so um, obviously that's where, that's where the book started. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, this was during early on in the Trump administration when there was a lot of focus on Russian involvement in the, in the election. So I brought together the, uh, the hearing where DeVos had um, uh, called out potential grizzlies as a, as a reason to arm teachers with this uh, involvement of Russians. And I sort of had, had the secret meeting between uh, DeVos and um, Russian grizzlies uh, to work out a truce. So that would that mean that we don't need guns anymore in our schools? If there, if there, yeah, yeah that, that was the point. Yeah, after, after they worked worked it out, the, the bears were no longer going to threaten the schools. So um, I, I particularly enjoyed your next piece on guns, which was Arizona approves first ammo centric charter school. <laughs> Yeah, the one that had to be, the only rule they had is that it had to be located near the emergency room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they would definitely be teaching kids how to use their weapons. Yes, yes. They, they were able to work the, you know, the, all the curricular ideas were, were um, focused on things you could learn around guns and... Uh, <laughs> the science of guns and the history of guns and yeah. mathematical principles associated yeah, you, with... with ballistics, guns, right? you get all sorts of... Yeah. You know, I'm afraid you may have given someone in Arizona an, an idea. <laughs> Everything else has been tried. I, you know, it's, it's funny. We, um, anyone who tries to write satire these days gets frustrated when they read news stories that feel like they're better satire than, there was something just last week or the week before there was a um, Republican state Senator in Florida, of course, Florida, um, who announced plans to introduce legislation to create a, um, a new private school voucher program there. I am not making this up. For parents who don't want their children to wear masks in schools, he calls it the face freedom, <laughs> the face freedom private school voucher plan. Now I couldn't do any better than that. <laughs> I just feel like this guy should stay in his lane. You know, it's like <laughs> I write the satire, he does the legislation, but no, you know. You know, I'm afraid that that school will have a lot of applicants in the yeah. state of Florida. They'll be coming from all over. You better turn it into a boarding school. Uh, but you know, Florida has been the source of so many ideas that you could satirize. Uh, one that I particularly liked was uh, when they said that, the, I think it was called their, um, it was the best program, BEST program for um, new teachers, or no, for te teacher ev evaluation and pay, that you would get more money dependent on your SAT scores. Oh, yes, that and actually consider exists. that you took your SAT as a junior or at most a senior in high school and 20, 10 years later or 20 years later, you're going to be judged or evaluated or given an award based on your SAT score. Yeah. Well, and there's also it was called best, best and brightest. That was the name of the program. The best, yeah. And it, and it still exists. I believe they still have that law in the books there. It also reminds me in Florida, they, um, you know, they had one of these laws that we were talking about earlier that attached teacher evaluations to their um, test scores. But if, as you know, lots of teachers work in fields that students aren't tested in. And so if you were, for example, a PE teacher in Florida, you were told to choose a field, basically an area that students are tested in that you think is relevant to what you're teaching and you know, put that into your you know, official records and that's how you will be evaluated. So you're going to say, well, maybe math. So the students' math scores then go into the teacher's evaluation who's teaching PE. And that was challenged in court. And the, 
the judge said, this is just about as absurd as a thing I've ever seen, but I don't think I can strike it down. <laughs> so what still, I recall was, the I followed that because it was so crazy. And they said, we're, the Florida Education Association sued. And they said it wasn't fair because we're being evaluated based on teachers on children we never taught and subjects we never taught. And the judge said, it may be unfair, but it's not unconstitutional. Yeah. And he let it stand and they are still a value. And there's 70% of teachers are not, don't have scores uh, based on the three through eight. They're either high school teachers, first and second grade teachers uh, are teaching the arts and elementary schools, teaching something that's not tested, a science teacher. And then when you think really what they should let them do is choose the field, whether it's math or reading after the scores are published. <laughs> that would be fair, but it's very unfair. So uh, talk a bit about the PISA scores. <laughs> that, that was just, that was low hanging fruit. <laughs> high, high fructose fruit. Um, so, you know, that every year or every, every several years we have the PISA, the Program and in International Student Assessment, I think it is, uh, scores that come out, which is sort of the international comparisons of student testing. Um, and it's always the same. It's always this hand wringing that comes out. And we're, we're basically, we never move. We're, we're right around the same place we've always been. Um, and the same countries tend to be on the top and the bottom. And those scores, as you know, are largely determined by things that take place outside of schools. Um, and there are some actually some really good analyses of that that show that if you have a more equitable society and, and address poverty in a serious way in larger society, your PISA scores will go up. Um, but anyway, the, the, the piece is, a, is not really about that. The piece is about how junk food is marketed to kids and, um, and kids don't you know, exercise enough and get away from those screens we were talking about enough. So it's, uh, I forgot what the acronym was, but it's P-I-Z-Z-A, uh, the PISA scores. And, and we do really, really well at that. We, we put those Finnish and Singaporean kids to shame on the PISA scores. Pizza scores, excuse me. You know, every once in a while, the, these international scores get debunked by someone who points out that they have absolutely no relationship to um, productivity, economic success. I remember years ago, uh, there was a guy who was an analyst at the US Department of Education who went back to the earliest uh, international assessments. And he said, you know, we came in last, Japan came in first and, uh, by every measure, whether it's economic productivity or uh, cultural success, we, but he had a whole bunch of outcomes that would be apparent 30 years later. The scores had no bearing on anything. They didn't tell anything. They didn't predict anything. And if it would be nice if we could get across the idea somehow the media, which tells it to the American public, there is no Sputnik moment. Uh, I mean, the Russians never got ahead of us. So Sputnik didn't mean anything. This is all just, these are scare tactics and uh, it all becomes uh, a way of saying we have to test more and test harder and have higher standards and keep kids in school longer and blah, blah, blah. It's, it's yeah. part of a propaganda campaign, but the public should understand these scores predict nothing and they don't get that. The media should understand that the media don't get it. It's, it's meaningless. So well, then we get to in a broader sense, it's hard for people to, and we just saw it with the polling in the you know, in the election. It's hard for people to make meaning of numbers. Um, numbers, you know, once once we see a number attached to something, whether it's a teacher's growth score or a polling number or the PISA scores, it it gives that thing this um, concreteness um, and it reifies something that probably should never be thought of as anywhere near that concrete. Um, well, I think that's what's happened with the test scores is that we have, uh, at least since No Child Left Behind and even before, we, we, it's like we're addicted to them. And we can't imagine uh, having any kind of accountability that doesn't involve test scores. And I remember uh, years ago when I first met Pazi Salberg from Finland, and Finland had just come in number one in the PISA rankings. And I said, um, well, tell us about, you know, how do you test in Finland? He said, we don't have standardized tests in Finland. Uh, we have a, he called it a standardized test-free zone. 
and that's up until ninth grade. I think at ninth grade, they take a test to determine which kind of school they're gonna to go to, whether it'll be vocational or academic, and they're free to switch them if they want to. And I said, then if you don't have test scores, how do you hold students and teachers accountable? And he said, well, we don't have a word in Finnish for accountability. Our word is, the closest word to that, he said, would be responsibility, and our teachers are very responsible. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a, a great answer. Then I went to Finland and I saw, they don't care about tests. He said, and I thought this was a great line. He said, you know, we like to ski a lot in Finland, but we never want to be first. We want to be second. We want somebody else to make the trail. And if they go off the trail and, and they find the trail's bad, we want to know that. We don't want to be the first, the first in the world. We don't want to be, we're happy to be second. But so it's a little unsettling to be first. And now they're second and they don't care because testing is just not that important. It's a nice attitude, I think. So your, your last section is on COVID-19 and talk a little bit, if you will, in our uh, remaining couple of minutes about what you want people to take away from these three pieces since you won't go into all three of them. What's, what's the point, main point? Yeah, you know, um, I mean, one of the pieces was a little painful. It was about the, um, you know, that the, that the school closings were, were really harmful and that the, um, the ICE, you know, the Immigration Enforcement um, Agency folks could no longer wait outside of schools to arrest parents. You know, it's a shame that they could, that they had they they lost that opportunity. Um, another piece was actually I'll, I'll, I'll mention it's it's called uh, anti vaxxers express coronavirus worries. Uh, and what was interesting about that one is I wrote it in March, like early to early to mid March, and I was thinking about it was. It was, I was thinking about it as an April Fool's piece, right? Um, we ended up not doing an April Fool's piece because by that point it was clear that coronavirus was just not, it was too early to laugh. Um, and uh, it probably still is. The, um, but the, what I wrote was men, you know, it gets, gets to this point of reality overtaking satire. It was this crazy thing about how these anti-vaxxers were really concerned about coronavirus. It was very serious, but they were, the concern was that um, it would be used to get people to get vaccines, right? That was the big fear that they had. And it's not, it's not satire, it's real, right? I mean, the anti-vaxxers have been out in force saying this is all just some big hoax to get us to take vaccines. So I included the piece. I thought it was funny when I wrote it, um, but, but there is a, um, yeah, it's another one of those instances where you try to satirize something and the truth is just overtakes. The reality it. overtakes the satire. Yeah. And yeah. I think that uh, when, there is a vac when there is a vaccine, a lot of people are not gonna take it because uh, either they don't like vaccines or they think there's a conspiracy or uh, they think that it's been politicized to an extent where they can't trust the vaccine. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's uh, one of those instances where uh, it's hard to tell the difference between satire and reality, but both of them are looking kind of grim right now. Well, we have some wonderful questions um, that our viewers have for the two of you. And right now, then I'm going to introduce Marla. And uh, Marla, can you share some of the questions, both the serious and the ludicrous with, uh, with our guests? Yes, we have a lot of questions. Um, a lot of them are surrounding um, the new pick for Secretary of Education. So um, I'll throw out the first one from Cesar Rivera uh, to both of you, Diane and Kevin. Is Linda Darling Hammond going to pick a Secretary of Education who will embrace dismantling standardized Testing. So Linda's not doing the picking. Um, she's she's the head of uh, the transition team, um, but that the transition team doesn't pick the uh, doesn't pick the secretary. Um, I think that that the um, the Biden campaign made very clear that they are not enthusiastic about the level of high stakes testing that's occurred. I don't know. I mean, you know, it's sort of like we felt, you know, once once bitten, twice shy, I guess is the rule, but you know, that this idea that, you know, the polling around um, Donald Trump in 2016 made us really wary. And I think that the signals in 2016 around who would become 
education secretary uh, and then follow, followed by Duncan's appointment also makes us wary. Um, mm -hmm. It's hard to trust. So I don't know. Diane, what do you think? Well, to begin with, I have no idea who might be chosen. And, and I suspect that unless the two Senate seats in Georgia were to become Democrats, that Mitch McConnell would have a veto over any choice. And so there's a question about if, if he were to choose, for example, uh, either Randy Weingarten or Lily Eskelson Garcia, would Mitch McConnell approve? And who knows? I don't know. Uh, what will happen with high stakes testing? Of course, my hope would be that uh, the Biden administration would recognize the failure of race at the top and the failure of standardized testing. I mean, we've had 10 years in which the NAEP scores have been completely stagnant. And um, it's as good an indication as any we have that the things that have been happening in terms of using test scores to punish people, to close schools, to fire people, that this is a very bad way to go. Uh, will the Secretary of Education share that? I don't know. I, I can only say that in Washington, D.C., most of the elected officials don't think very much about education. And consequently, they tend to go with the flow. And the flow is, how will we know anything unless we have standardized test scores? And that's why we've had 20 years of No Child Left Behind, followed by Race to the Top, followed by Every Student Succeeds Act, all of which were attached to high stakes standardized testing. And um, Will Biden have the uh, a secretary who says we have to break with the past? The past has failed. I don't know. I hope so. There was also the NCLB waivers, remember, pushing this. Yeah. And I think the first thing we have to watch with Biden is whether uh, his secretary says, I will grant universal waivers to every state for the spring of 21. To me, it is absolutely absurd to think that children are going to face high stakes testing in the spring after having such an um, incredibly disrupted fall. Uh, they've not, they will not have had enough time. And I don't think it's a good idea under the best of circumstances, but these are the worst of circumstances. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens with that. I think right now it's just too soon to tell. And to stay on the Secretary of Education, uh, Mike DeGuire asks, are you hopeful that there will be a non-reform minded Secretary of Education? I have to say I'm completely in the dark. Uh, I think that Biden has said a lot of things during the campaign that made me very hopeful and optimistic that he would choose someone who is non-reform. Uh, I think right now the problem is, I mean, the word reform is, Kevin points out again and again, his book has been so corrupted uh, that it's become a bad word. It's amongst people who are aware of what's happening in the schools, it's a corrupt word. It means not that you want to improve schools, but that you want to close them and blow them up and replace them with, with vouchers or charters or anything but a traditional public school. Um, I think that uh, you know the ne Network for Public Education and National Education Policy Center are in agreement that this has been a terrible strategy and that we should have hopefully someone in uh, the secretary's chair who understands this. The part of the problem is that there is a very deep bench right now of reform candidates. Uh, they have had 20 years in which to uh, give huge stipends to people uh, to be superintendents of school, to go through the Broad Superintendents Academy and then take over an urban school district. So there is a, a large bench of people who believe in closing schools, punishing teachers, uh, using high stakes testing for nefarious purposes. And um, when people say, who do you think is a good candidate? There is a list, but it's not as long a list as the people who are steeped in high stakes testing and, and charter schools. What do you think, Kevin? Yeah, I mean, the, the I'm reminded, I, I have a piece in there about the Broad Academy also. Um, the, um, I also am completely in the dark. Uh, I, I, I'm hopeful. But again, a little wary. But I'm I'm looking over at Carol's picture over here because <laughs> Carol mentioned that I've known her for about 20 years, and I met her in the context of reform. Um, and the word reform needs to be reformed again. I think um, it's there's this Carol just just if you don't know she was she was an acclaimed principal of a school that led the country on detracking reform, um, and the school 
was, and I think hopefully still is, a beacon that attracts people who are interested in that reform and seeing it well done. Um, reform is needed. And um, so this idea that reform has been taken to mean just one type of change that isn't backed by research and isn't helpful for kids is a shame. I mean, we need, we need some, some new word or we need to reclaim that one. Um, and so I was just thinking about uh, pieces that I wish I wrote um, <laughs> for this, and and uh, this word reform is one of is one of the areas that I did focus on. But I was just thinking I, I need to write a piece on the the transition that we're talking about, the Biden, you know, the the, the um, what the new secretary has to do and what the transition team has to do, and I, I want to call it D D Vossing. Um, it's sort of a, a new term we need to come up with as a DD Voss, um, but that's essentially what they need to do is to, to come in and, and um, reverse so much of what has happened over the last four years. And I, I hope and expect that that's what, that's what the, uh, the new secretary will do, but we'll have to see. Well, you know, the old term is personnel is policy. And so yeah. um, I, I, I'm very heartened by uh, President-elect Biden's public statements. He said that uh, he will take action against for-profit charters. I'm hoping that he's including for-profit management organizations. Uh, mm -hmm. And he also made very strong statements about uh, standardized testing. So that's what he said. And now we have to wait and see who he chooses and whether that person uh, follows through on, on what were seemed to me to be very clear promises on his part. Yeah. Um, we have, I guess that really segues really well into the next question. Um, what is both of your greatest hope and greatest worry about this new administration? Well, my greatest hope is that the president-elect, uh, the, the president, uh, his vice president, the, the whole administration knows that, that, that what we've done for the past 20 years has been a disaster and everything else can flow from there. Because if they understand that what we've been doing hasn't worked and has been bad for kids, bad for teachers, bad for education, uh, and that huge amounts of money has been wasted on uh, frivolous things uh, and recognizes that we cannot afford to have two or three competing school systems, all of them publicly funded. That to me would be my greatest hope that to have them aware that we needed a new vision. I mean, we are talking now and Kevin mentioned this earlier that what was called reform is now the status quo. And it's become the conventional wisdom about, you know, charter schools and choice and all of these things. I think it, at least in my mind, I see very clearly that choice has been a dead end. And we have um, some of the people who were interviewed here earlier, like Derek Black and Steve Suits, have said the whole term school choice was born out of resistance to the Brown decision. This is not a fresh idea. This is a, a segregationist idea. We should not be embracing this. Uh, we should be embracing an equitable, well-resourced public education system. And if you want choice, that's fine, pay for it. But if you want to have great public schools, pay for that with public money. So. That's my hope. My greatest fear is that somebody who looks and sounds like Arnie Duncan will be, be back. <laughs> Actually, I thought he was out of central casting from Hollywood in terms of the look. <laughs> but um, the, yeah, I mean, it's a great question. Uh, it's something I don't think I've asked myself. Uh, and um, I think you know, a lot of what Diane said is pretty much where I, I let me add, add one thing to that though. Um, and it gets to the book that Carol mentioned that she said she liked <laughs> earlier book from 2013 called Closing the Opportunity Gap. Um, and that book brought together experts from a lot of different areas to, to explore how our, how our opportunity gaps arise, from what sources opportunity gaps arise. And the reality is in, in this country at least that most of our measured variance in kids' outcomes is attributable to societal inequality, to things outside the schools. So yes, our schools are unequal and our schools are 
in a lot of ways in need of more resources for some kids, and actually for all kids, um, and for a lot of change. But, but the, the, the main driving force for inequality in our society is the, the vast uh, economic and racial um, inequality in our, larger, in our larger system. So concentrated poverty, poverty in general, racism, those are what's driving the, uh, the larger uh, the gaps. And so I guess my greatest hope would be that, that this administration realizes that and doesn't take education policy and sort of silo it away from uh, housing policy and transportation policy and economic policy, labor policy, so many other areas that um, determine what sort of life chances children have. Okay. Our next question is from Marianne Killian, and this is actually directed to you, Kevin. Um, she really looks forward to reading your book and finally getting some laughs from this very profound tragedy. Um, she writes, I think the source of this tragedy lies with free market ideologues who do not want a well-educated electorate. What are your thoughts on that? You know, it's interesting, Marianne. I, 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 I've been thinking about that in part because several people have said it to me <laughs> um, that that this that the election where we're seeing over seventy million people say yes, I want more of that um, is proof positive that something seriously is wrong with our schools. Um, that um, is a um, you know, a condemnation of at least the teaching of civics, but really probably more the teaching of a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's probably some truth to that, that our schools should be focusing a lot more on civics and understanding um, the, the role of government and the role of competence in government and that, that sort of thing, but also sort of the, the place of each individual within our society and understanding the importance of a healthy community and a variety of other things involving critical thinking. But I also think that kids, people, people in our society are, whether it's us you know, who are out of school or people who are still in school, I think more, more of our thinking and values and um, self is, is now determined by the algorithms in Facebook and Twitter than by what takes place in school. Mm -hmm. And obviously by other things, you know, peer, peer effects and what goes on with families and communities. So many other things are important in terms of kids. And I wonder if we're just, again, falling into that trap of overestimating the role of schools in the outcomes that we see. Um, that said, I mean, the, the the basis of your question, Marianne, was more about um, whether, there, whether there are people who really don't want to see our schools, mm -hmm. our, our schools succeed in that way. Um, I guess I'm, I'm in the camp that they probably just don't care and they, that they're comfortable, the people, you know, the, the free market ideologues you're talking about are, are more than comfortable with where things um, are in, in so many other areas and aren't worried about our schools in terms of that role. I think that, that the animosity that, that I see from free market ideologues toward public schools is that they're just a vestige of socialism, that, they, you know, that we shouldn't have our, our, our communities collecting money and putting it toward this common cause that you know, this, this, again, socialistic idea of public schools, it's, it's an anathema to them because it's, um, it's not private you know, and, and private is better. Well, that, that actually leads to our next question from Scott, Scott Balderman. He said, districts across the country have seen affluent families now enrolling in private schools. How long do you think it will be before these families return? Diane? Well, I think if they're paying the tuition, uh, they'll be back. Um, in the um, COVID crisis is over and hopefully it'll be over in the spring. I have no idea when it'll be over, but it will someday be over. Um, 
it's unfortunate that we live at a time when there's no effort to control it um, and there's no kind of coordinated federal strategy. We all know that. And so we're getting hit worse than probably most societies in the world. But in terms of the people who have chosen to put their kids in private school, uh, they're not gonna wanna pay for something that's free uh, once both places are safe, which brings me to a concern we didn't really talk about, but we now have a Supreme Court that seems poised to approve of vouchers. And um, if that happens, then there will be kids leaving for religious schools and um, private schools. And the amount of money they'll have to go to private schools will be for very second or third rate private schools because you can't the you know, when Betsy DeVos says poor kids should have the same choices as rich kids, it's a hoax because rich kids are going to schools where they pay 30 to $50,000 a year and the vouchers provide no more and very often less than public school tuition. So um, I think that's another problem we're going to face. Uh, but I, I do believe that when all of this is over that public schools may lose some students but that the overwhelming majority of students in America will still be in public schools and will still face the same problems. So I, I, had, I had the same reaction to that in, in the sense that the families that have chosen to, to, to send their kids to private schools had that option two years ago as well. And they chose, you know, and the ones we're talking about chose public schools and they were happy with their public schools. And a lot of them, wealthier families who can afford private schools also chose their neighborhoods because they wanted the, you know, their kids to assent, to attend that particular public school. Um, so given a return to normal, I think they would return to the, to the choice that they had before. Um, I think there are probably a, a small number, but, but a significant enough number to tell some interesting stories of families that tried out homeschooling and really liked it. Um, but we're talking a small number because it's, a, it's an acquired taste in the sense that you know, there's a, there are a lot of um, difficulties that come along with that and it takes a lot of uh, resources to do that well. Um, so I think for the most part, what we're talking about is a return to normal setting aside or you know, return to you know, what we had before, setting aside two variables. And I think Diane mentioned one of them, which is the push, the ongoing push to subsidize private education. And the second is the, the, the flip side of that coin, which is an ongoing push to remove money from public education. And the more we starve our public school system, the less attractive it becomes for families um, to continue to go to that public school system. And the more families disengage from or, or leave the public school system, the less likely they are to support bonds and otherwise support the, uh, the financing of public schools. And so it can become a, a vicious cycle, a, you know, a downward uh, spiral for um, keeping our public school system strong and attractive for families. I think that's the real concern. Um, not so much the virus and people doing things within this period of time that are necessary in their minds to support their kids' education, um, but sort of the long, the longer term um, investment in this important public institution. Yeah, we just got um, a couple of messages from um, one of our listeners named Mary Ann, and she said, um, in her area, the county ordered all public, private, and charter schools to go virtual today hmm. from November 30th to January 18th. So private school parents will now be paying tuition for nearly two months of at-home learning. That's in her area. Um, she also shared with us, just to keep this under our cap, that Biden's new chief of staff, Ron Klain, is a 1979 graduate of her daughter's still very strong public school. So, um, all right, our final question uh, for both of you. Uh, if you were the new Secretary of Education, this is a question from one of our listeners, what is the first thing you would do? Well, that, that's easy. The first thing I would do would be to grant blanket waivers from the 2021 testing. Yeah. And the second thing I would do would be to say that I'm going to help rewrite or launch a rewrite of the ESSSA uh, to eliminate the mandated testing. 
Yeah, gosh, there's such a long list. Um, DACA comes to mind, um, but you know, in terms of there are people who are living, you know, in the shadows right now who need some um, clear leadership. Um, but there are, you know, there are so many. Um, there's so much damage that's been done over the last four years. Um, that I, I mean, as, as a serious matter, I think what's happening right now with the transition team and what will be happening as soon as uh, January 21st comes around is just a full throttle attempt to, to reverse a lot of this damage. Uh, and some of that will just simply be returning to executive orders and guidances that were issued during the Obama administration, for example, around transgender kids uh, in Title, Title IX. Um, but also um, hopefully an improvement on some of those. Um, you know, and, and there's, unfortunately, this, you know, the Senate is not going to be, even if both Georgia seats are won by Democrats, the Senate is gonna be a difficult place um, to get through some, uh, some important legislation, including, you know, Diane mentioned ESSA. ESSA, believe it or not, it seems like it was just passed, but it's already expired by its terms. It's already up for reauthorization. Um, so, and that's true of, of several laws, uh, in fact, affecting education. IDEA, I believe, is way overdue. Um, so there are lots of things that legislatively need to get done that probably can't get done. But I think the first actions should be things like what Diane mentioned, you know, the, the important signaling things. Like this is, this is something you could stop worrying about. We've, we've, we're going to take care of this. Um, plan your life differently at this point, whether we're talking about something like testing or DACA or trans, you know, transgender discrimination, all, all these things, there are people who are, who are on pins and needles trying to um, go about their return to their lives that need some real guidance right now. And on that note, thank you. Thank you both uh, very much. This is, this has really been terrific. And, and, um, you know, if you want that wonderful book, Potential Grizzlies, um, that Kevin has generously um, offered to allow all proceeds from the book to go all, to our- All my royalties, yeah. All royalties, all royalties to go to our organization. So, so you're helping us out as well. Um, how, can, how can folks get it, Kevin? They can go on Amazon, right? And what other ways? So it's on, it's, it's just now making its way into, so there's a there's a system where a publisher once they publish a book they they put the information into a system and then it populates on these various online um, uh, booksellers. Amazon was the first to have this. I know it's been available to purchase on Amazon for a week or so, um, but Barnes and Noble now has it. I think without the picture, it's just getting uploaded. I, I Powell's bookstore has it. So it's in in various places that you can find. Um, the publisher also sells it if you're buying. I think three or more copies, it's better to get it through the publisher, but they charge a lot for shipping so that Amazon doesn't charge. Um, so if you're buying multiple copies, for, for example, for your school board, Scott, um, that there is a, uh, there probably is a benefit from buying it through the, through the publisher. Otherwise it's, it's um, you know, it's through the online booksellers. My understanding is that an ebook will be available soon, but it's not quite there yet. And thank you, thank you for writing it. I mean, we all we all need a good laugh, and I know was, I know Diane. Enjoyable went book I've ever. I mean, writing books is you know part of what I do, but this was, this was certainly the most enjoyable one in terms of writing. Yeah, and Diane, who has a fabulous sense of humor, really loved it. So so that's a very good endorsement endorsement right there. And and Kevin, thank you for all you do. Um, you are one of our greatest allies, and. Um, to, uh, to borrow an old term, right, thought leader, right? <laughs> term I actually hate, but, but you are, you really I just, are. I need a few thought followers, but being a thought leader is nice also. <laughs> and Diane, thank you so much for, for once again uh, spending, your, spending your time with us and, and making COVID just a little bit more bearable. <laughs> thank you, everybody. And thank good night. you. Thank you all. Good well, night. Thank you. Thanks, Diane. Thanks, Carol.